First, I would like to start um, with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AMS acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, and we acknowledge their connection to the land, the sea, and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So welcome everyone to our first, uh, our AMS uh, virtual seminar um, for February. Uh, the first with myself as president, my name is Jonathan Plett. I am at Western Sydney University and I have the pleasure of uh, taking over the presidency of this council from um, Tracy who is uh, step down because of work related reasons and we really want to thank her again for the amazing work she's done over the years for this society. And so it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker Dr Kylie Island, who uh, is working in broadly in the area of uh, biosecurity preparedness in Australia, making sure that we are safe and we can still plant things. <laughs> um, she is currently working um, in uh, the response for the polyphagia shock hole borer, and she's going to be talking to us today about her work. So with that, Kylie, I turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Um, and I can see a few familiar um, names in the participants, so good to see you all. Um, I'll get started in a minute, but first I just wanted to point out your logo, which of course is mycological, um, but looks a lot like uh, a gallery as well, like we get with the ambrosia beetles and polyphagus being one of those ambrosia beetles. So I, of course, am a plant pathologist, um, but working on a beetle. So um, it's been really interesting. Um, so today I'm gonna basically cover PSHB in Western Australia. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of the um, pathology background, but I have popped a few slides in there for interest um, and to go through that, but just to give you an overview of what we're doing here, what we're finding um, and what it means. So to start, uh, we first detected PSHB in WA in August 2021. So it's crazy to think it's been 18 months already. And the report came in via the My Pest Guide Reporter app, um, which is an incredible tool. We've had a number of reports come in through this way. Um, and it was on two 30-year-old box elder maple trees in East Fremantle, and it was the first detection in Australia. And the symptoms we had come in were these incredible galleries on a limb that had fallen down off this tree behind us here. Um, so poor weather compromised limb has come down. So beautiful um, example of PSHB symptoms, as well as on the actual trunk, this was a very heavy beetle load. Um, and you get these tree noodles as well as you can see the edge there around of a um, kind of fungal colony and the lesion of where the fungus might be growing sometimes into and around the bark as well. Um, and the image behind is us taking out the tree as quickly as possible um, to try and reduce the risk of spread from that particular tree. Uh, so polyphagus shot hole borer, um, it is an ambrosia beetle uh, known as Ulac fornicatus. It lives in symbiosis with a fungus, which is why it's nice to work on it as a plant pathologist. Um, and they carry ambrosia clade fusarium species, which more broadly sit in the fusarium solani complex. Uh, they excavate tunnels and cultivate the fungus as a food source. So they're not um, consuming the wood of the tree. They basically are just shoofing that all out so that they can be their own little beetle farmers. Um, and it's that combination of the galleries and then the fungus, as you can see, growing into the tissue. So you get the gallery and usually in a highly susceptible host it might go a few centimetres from those galleries, but the fungus is always associated with the galleries. It doesn't tend to um, move in um, the plant uh, systemically, which is one one good thing about PSHB, but it still causes a lot of damage where it does. So um, causing branch and tree death by um, disrupting that vascular system. The beetles are really small. They're only about two millimetres in size, the females, um, which are the, it's a really female dominated population, about the size of a sesame seed. Um, this is a lovely photo taken by James Bickerstaff at CSIRO, who we've been providing some samples to. Um, and they're just, they're a very, very cute little beetle. Um, and the males, again, are even smaller. So about two millimetres for the female and about 1.6 millimetres for the males. And they tend to be a little lighter in colour 
um, but we don't tend to see them very often um, compared to the females. The life history, if you're not familiar with ambrosia beetles, um, they spend most of their life in a tree. Um, they have a haplodiploid mating system, which means that you only need a single beetle um, to evade capture to start a new population. And it has a really female bias sex ratio. So within that, typically she'll be mated before she leaves the natal gallery. But if she's not, she will actually, um, her first clutch of eggs she will lay will be a lot more um, haploid eggs and those become male. And then she will um, mate with those, uh, her offspring to be able to lay diploid eggs and produce more females. In terms of a beetle, they have a really short development time. So it can be as low as 22 days at 24 degrees Celsius, but it's usually about a month or so normally, um, which means we're likely to see it reproduce all year in WA. I think when Helen Narung from Queensland did some very quick modeling um, of the degree days that we know for PSHB in just in Fremantle, when we had that initial detection, I think there was less than two weeks when the weather wasn't gonna be good for growth. That's not to say survival. So it was pretty much survival all year round and it was really just growth that might be a little bit staggered. Uh, it has a really high reproductive rate. So brood size typically of 20 to 50 eggs. Um, and the females are the only ones to fly. Um, they're very small, they're two millimetres. So if they do fly, they typically will only go 30 to 35 metres to the next suitable host. Um, there's some um, evidence from South Africa, especially now that they can go a little bit farther if they are so inclined. But as a general rule, they're very small and um, they literally, if they can come out on the same tree, walk down and find a new spot on that same tree, if that tree is still capable of holding a colony, they will just stay on that same tree they were born in as well. Uh, the potential impacts of PSHB, um, the biggest impact uh, globally has been on urban and amenity trees, and especially that loss of canopy cover, because it tends to affect more mature trees. So you're taking out, you know, in some cases, 80, 90 year old trees that have been there for some time. Well, for, obviously, there's a lot of cultural connection to a lot of those trees as well. Fruit and tree crops, we're still watching the data on that. In California, it hasn't been a very big impact. The avocado industry in general are not incredibly worried about PSHB. It can cause damage and it can be a problem, um, but only in non poorly managed um, orchards, um, which was really good information for them and for us. Um, but the it's now moved into the Somerset region and around Stellenbosch and others in the Western Cape of South Africa. And we're seeing it move into some orchards there, which are completely different growing conditions from Israel and California, where a lot of that data was coming out of. So we'll be watching that closely. Um, but even if it doesn't cause a lot of damage, it, the adapt to, adapting to management will be um, quite um, significant as well. But as it is with a lot of these things, the full impact won't be known for some time. So when we're looking for PSHB, the key symptom are these shot holes here. Um, so they're about one millimetre in size. They can expand or contract a little bit, we think just with temperature and whatnot um, on a tree, but they are perfectly round. I just can't believe that a little beetle can make something so beautifully round. Um, every now and then you'll get lucky and you'll open up and you'll see um, be able to see a really uh, well-established galleries in trees as well. You'll get frass in all different forms with, um, I'll go into the host list in a moment, massive host list. So you get a lot of different host responses, but you'll get sometimes these tree noodles or just powdery frass. Uh, gumming on some trees or kind of white sap flow on figs. You'll occasionally get lesions or staining around the shot holes if the fusarium is taking hold in that space. Um, and on things like avocados, we get what we call sugar volcanoes, um, which is a common response for them to a lot of injury, be it mechanical or biological. Um, and so if you've got it, but if you've got a shot hole, as you can see right at the center of something like that, then um, it's more likely to be PSHB. Our current top hosts, uh, it's a lot of the exotic trees to Australia, um, a lot of deciduous trees, um, which are often very prized um, for their shade in summer and their 
and opening up and providing warmth in winter. So the maples are the absolute top. Um, then we've got oaks, plane trees, coral trees, avocados. Um, Robinias have become really important in the West Australian landscape as have figs and poplars. Um, and so our top two hosts though at the moment, and I'll cover some of our others um, in a few slides time, have been Maples, even within maples, it's been predominantly Ace and Agundo, so um, the box elder maple and those Robinias. And so we actually do a lot of work to try and get people to report box elder maples because they're an incredible sentinel. Um, we've even had a case recently where we picked it up in the tree before we picked it up on a trap that we had nearby. Um, so, because if you're a little beetle, you're probably going to be, there's probably something way more attractive about um, a tree host than just some sticky trap with a with a lure on it. Uh, the PH, PSHB hosts globally, it's a really large host list. Um, so we're talking a host range of well over 400 plant species. Um, it's over 500 ta taxa. Um, I haven't done the count recently again. Uh, box elder maple, as I said, and their relatives. There's a lovely paper by Shannon Lynch. Um, which shows that those that are more closely related to a box elder maple and its relatives are more likely to die from PSHB and for the fungus to do well in them. Um, and so that's a really nice piece of work because um, I haven't seen a lot of generalists that kind of data um, generated on that. But the problem is if tree health is compromised, we do see that it may move up in its general host status. And an example of that for us here in WA has been, we've only had two cases of um, red flowering gum, Corymbia fissifolia, and we knew it could be a host in California, but only when it had Botrys feriaceae cankers, and they were actually infesting aside the Botrys feriaceae cankers. We haven't seen cankers on our trees here, but the two trees that we've had were both in compromised conditions on poor soils, old waste sites, um, and potentially overwatered, and they had a whole lot of other um, kind of biological things going on as well. So um, we have looked at hundreds of them across, they're planted very widely as a street tree and we don't see them as hosts everywhere. Um, there are two main host categories, the most important of those being the reproductive hosts. So those are the ones that can support beetle reproduction. And because of that, they're more likely to be severely damaged by PSHB and some can die. Um, so we've got um, anecdotal evidence now that something like a box elder can die within a year. Um, a compromised oak in South Africa can die in as little as two years. Um, but in general, if it's a healthier oak, it can see out to four years after the first infestation. Uh, and the non-reproductive hosts we say are not recorded as supporting beetle reproduction because um, we've added a lot of hosts to our reproductive list and some of that has probably been as well because we're looking very, very closely at each of our hosts, um, whether or not they would be very suitable hosts in the longer term. A lot of them, I don't think they necessarily would be, but they can, some of them, our reproductives can carry, but are probably more likely to be non-reproductive as a general rule. Um, and they can often tolerate PSHB damage as well. And even some of the reproductive hosts that are less suitable for reproduction can tolerate damage quite well. And in California and South Africa, where they're managing rather than eradicating, um, they have a much different sit approach to hosts than we do. And uh, we keep the global and WA host lists as up to date as we can about on about a monthly basis because we've had some very infested sites, so we're adding them regularly. Um, so if you're ever interested, just go to the um, agric WA forward slash borer website. Uh, so for this audience, I've added in the technical slides again. Um, so if we think, so for those who are interested in diagnostics, um, the difficult thing about PSHB is that it, until about 2019, it was part of kind of a complex. They'd started to figure out that they were different and things like that. Um, but pretty much any literature you look at before 2019 or so, you have to be very careful about how you interpret it. Um, so the beetles, both the beetle and the fusarium, I mean, anyone who's worked with fusarium know that, knows that you need to look at molecular confirmation 
um, you need to use at least CO1 for beetle and we use a multi-locus um, approach for the fusarium. The fusarium we don't isolate as much, it's a lot quicker and easier to do the beetle diagnostics, um, but any new hosts we um, make the effort to especially get it out of the wood material to show that there's that host association there. Um, and speaking to um, our colleague Monica Kehoe, who does all the molecular diagnostics on this, it's really only a couple of base pairs even between fusarium, the fusarium species we have, which is AF18 and AF17, there's really not much difference. So um, it's a little bit difficult to start simplifying down to just using one loci. Um, is my understanding and anyone who's interested should um, follow up with um, Monica on her methods if they're interested. So um, the key thing here is we've got four things within that sensulato. We have fornicatus. Um, Corocio is also known from Southern California. Um, T-shot hole Bora clade A is per brevis, it's known from Florida as well as from um, Queensland. So Southeast Queensland also into um, Atherton Tablelands and the north, north coast of New South Wales and most recently was detected in um, Sydney as well. So that's for them it's good because the host range and the impacts of TSHB appear to be at least from the literature and everything we can see much lower than polyphagous shot hole borer. So the species really matters with this, even though they're so closely related, their host associations and potential damage are quite different. And I think fornication might be in PNG, if I remember correctly. Um, you can see it on this map, this beautiful paper by Wang et al, um, where you've got fornication here. And in this paper, they even make the case that you could split polyphagous shot hole borer even further, as you can see, PSHB one, two, and three. Um, but I won't get into the species discussion for that one right now. Um, you can also, and the reason why we have to do molecular on that beetle is um, even though we have no indication, everything has been just PSHB that we've checked. Um, there's no indication that these exist even once they're on a trap and they're a little smooshed, they can be a little bit difficult to um, identify compared to other ambrosia beetles that are already in the Australian environment. So um, fruit pinhole borer, for example, Xylobora saxenii, which usually infests more dead wood material, has been one of the ones on traps that we've, we've had confusion at. And that's really important because they're often moved around as well. Um, they've been here for some time. They're not really causing damage. Um, but they can be picked up, especially on green waste traps. So we have a lot of green waste sites. And of course, there's a lot of dead wood material out at green waste sites. And so those beetles are moving about as well. So uh, where did PSHB come from? Um, so it's native to Southeast Asia, uh, which you would have seen in that Wang diagram as well, that there's a large diversity through um, Southeast Asia into North Asia as well. Uh, being all contiguous. Um, so what we do know is that in that native range of Southeast Asia and into North Asia as well, um, we have a diversity of beetles and Ambrosia fusarium species. So, and then in the main um, invaded regions, so from about 2003, they picked it up in Southern California, 2009 in Israel, and South Africa in 2017, they all share this same haplotype of the beetle, H33, and they all have Fusarium ulacea, which is one of the Ambrosia clade Fusariums. There is also Fusarium ulacea associated with a novel, um, I call it novel, it's not novel, it's just that it wasn't in the number list when they um, first gave them all numbers in some of those papers. Um, so it's just a different, um, haplotype, but still carrying Fusarium ulacea. Whereas for us, we actually have the haplotype 38, which South Africa also has. So they've had likely more than one introduction, same with California, more than one introduction. Um, but our Fusarium is different and we have Fusarium species AF18. And what we do know about those two haplotypes and Fusarium species, um, and it must be, should be always said that the, you know, there hasn't been a, an incredible depth of surveillance throughout that um, native range, um, is that 
the beetle has been of that haplotype is known from Taiwan, Vietnam and China. And then Fusarium species AF18 has been recorded from Taiwan as well. So for the fun little part, these are the slides I don't usually give to a, a regular audience, even though everyone finds it super interesting. Um, the beetles carry the uh, fungus in what's called uh, mycangia, so little sacs within their heads. Um, and these are just some incredible slide, um, images from a paper by Freeman, um, which covers the Ulac fornicatus, um, which is the Fusarium ulaceae fungus predominantly. Um, and just being able to show with GFP that um, though that is where the mycangia are and that's where they're carrying those spores, especially when they're flying. Um, and just as an example, a related beetle, Ulaceae validus, just showing um, from the Casson group, just a beautiful, a really beautiful paper. And I'll go into a short slide on the next one as well, just showing where they're holding those spores within those, those sacs. Um, and depending on the species of Ulaceae or Ambrosia beetle, those sacs can be in different parts of um, ordinarily the head. So the other cool thing that I find really interesting and especially again for this audience is um, this is from that same paper by Casson, just beautiful work showing that there's speculation that there, the, there's this production of what they call clavate macroconidia by Fusaria associated with these Ulaceae species um, and that that may represent an adaptation for the symbiosis. Um, so I always think of it as being like little beetle lollipops, basically they've made them the right shape for them to be able to grab grasp and actually um, pop into those mycangia. So really beautiful work there by that group. Um, unfortunately, Ulaceae or AF and AF-10 aren't represented here, but we do have the Fusarium species AF-7 that has been since um, identified as, I think it's been named as Obliquicetum or something like that. So this is the one that's associated with um, T shot hole borer in um, Queensland. And unfortunately, I don't have slides out of our labs just yet. Um, but this is just a little picture of our Fusarium species AF18 in culture, which probably looks like every other Fusarium you've ever seen. Um, but it's nice to gaze at that every now and then. So now down to the nuts and bolts of what we do on the ground. Um, so obviously my day job, I don't get to spend a lot of time in the lab, if at all. Um, the lines are, you know, I'm more in a um, desktop role these days. Uh, but within the response, then we are working within a national framework for polyphagous shot hole borer. We have a quarantine area and restrictions. We're doing a lot of surveillance and trapping. We're managing a lot of infested trees um, and to underpin all of that, as you can imagine, is a lot of communications and stakeholder engagement, including the kind of work that I do, um, that I'm doing today. So for those who aren't familiar with the nationally coordinated response, I won't belabor it, but um, basically we're working on a um, kind of longer term eradication, phased eradication plan. So. Um, it's a forest pest, it's a difficult one that's going to be very difficult to eradicate, but um, if we worked in a phased approach um, and we can improve some of our detection and management methods, then I think we can really get close to it. Um, and that operates under the plant pest response deed and the resp response plan. So when we found first found PSHB, we report it to our chief plant biosecurity officer, she reports it to the national chief plant health officer and then they um, convene the consultative committee on emergency plant pests um, who are all of those chief plant health officers across the country um, as well as industry partners who have a stake in a response. We also had a scientific advisory panel for PSHB. There was no contingency plan or anything in particular for PSHB. So this meant that we were able to draw in international and national experts on forest health and on PSHB. We made recommendations back to the CCPP. They then recommend about management. And now we're at this stage where we're in an incident response and there's communication back and forth throughout um, as we move forward. 
So the quarantine area requirements are based on the biology of the beetle. Um, and so it's a very large area, but we ask people that, so they can move anything within that quarantine area. Ideal if they know it's infested to not move it further. And if we know it's infested, they get an additional control notice that they're not allowed to move it off that property as well. Um, wood more than 2.5 centimetres in diameter, it just needs to be chipped down to that size because um, you get a 99% kill rate on the beetle then. Um, living plants that are greater than two centimetres don't leave the QA and machinery just needs to be cleaned of wood. Um, and a permit can be organised if you can't meet those requirements. Uh, the response statistics, it's, oh, I'm so grateful to work with such an incredible crew who do so much work um, across different parts of DPIRD and um, a lot of our uh, casual staff who are in as well. So we have more than 356 premises now um, with PSHB. So we're covering that. This area here is more than 600 square kilometres. Uh, we've had, I mean, it's an incredible number, an incredible stat of more than 1.27 million individual tree inspections. So some of those will be duplications, but that's still a staff member has gone to a tree, looked at a tree, logged that visit, logged that visit. Um, so we're covering a lot of ground. Um, and for our positive trees, you know, 748, and we've removed almost 500 of those. And we've also pruned some of them as well. It's a lot of work that we've been doing. And we also have, I'll cover it in a moment, um, about three and a half thousand traps out there as well to try and pick up early detection. So the traps for an overview, um, this is a quasiverol lure that we pop onto the trap. They used to have a hat, but we found it's not necessary for this. Uh, trap in a cage to prevent any little birdies getting caught and a little info thing um, for people so that they know what it's being used for. Uh, they can get a little bit of information and it also has a QR code that they can, will, will direct them to the website for more information. So as you can see, we trap across the entire quarantine area grid on about a 1.5 kilometre grid. Um, we trap at green waste facilities. There are a lot of these concentrations outside here um, because green waste still moves out under an exemption of the quarantine area notice, has to be covered, needs to be trapped to be able to allow for that. And we do do some regional trapping as well. And as you can see here, uh, most of our positive traps have been really within three to six kilometres of the major rivers here, so the Swan and the Canning. Um, that, that also aligns with um, where we're finding trees, which I'll cover in a moment. And it also aligns where a lot of mature trees that are more susceptible and um, kind of yards that are bigger and can carry large trees in them also are. So again, the tree detections. Um, so also a little bit out, which was probably waste material, or not waste material, risk material moving. But yeah, you can see again along the, the rivers. You can also see we have moved to morphological identification. As I said, this doesn't happen for traps because of the condition of the beetles, um, but we do do it for um, from trees because we have enough data now to know that it's consistently those same beetles and if we're comfortable with the morphological um, because morphologically if they're nice clean beetles it's really easy to find um, separate a xyloborus from a um, ulaceae then um, we do it that way but any new hosts or anything where we're not sure we do still do the um, PCR um, positives. And we also are treating across that whole area. So um, when we get some things that are further out, we try and work out in so that we can um, contain as we try to eradicate. Um, but yeah, a lot of work has gone on and you can see, um, yeah, a lot of work with chipping and our team as we have um, kind of compliance or op operations or what we call BAM um, officers who go out and double check that the chip is to the right size before it moves off site off those um, infested material sites. So uh, some of the interesting stuff, again, um, the host lists are up online. Um, I'm just going to go through our top ones here. So I've put the, the number of trees we have recorded as well as the number of infested premises that come off. And infested premises can be anything from as small as someone's backyard to as large as King's Park. So um, they can be 
we think of an infected infested premises as being something that's connected as a property on its own right, not by size. Um, top one, same, similar story overseas as well, box elder maple. As I said, our rabinias are our next one down. The coral trees are quite um, active as well, and that includes the hybrid Sykesii and um, the coral, African coral tree as well, and a few that we're still trying to double check. A lot of them will end up probably being the hybrid Sykesii because it's very popular across the landscape, but just making sure we don't have any different species in there. Uh, Morton Bay figs are our next one down, Poinciana's, so you're talking really big trees here. Um, Port Jackson figs, our London plains weren't an issue until this last summer. Oh, sorry, this summer right now. So we had maybe seen less than five last year. And this year we've just started, the numbers have gone up. So whether that's seasonal or that we have a larger beetle population, we're still keeping an eye on that. Um, it's just observational data. Uh, one of our new hosts, the sea hibiscus, so this is a new global host, um, is also a host and it's planted broadly across the landscape. Uh, mirror bush as well is quite popular. Um, and then more so in people's backyards, we tend to see common figs, mulberries, Chinese hibiscus and avocado can also be affected. And as you would have seen from that map, it's not in our avocado growing regions yet. And so um, it's been, yeah, really good. To, and this is similar to what they're seeing overseas that avocado orchards don't, uh, you'll get avocados in people's backyards, but not um, a large damage in an orchard. So that's more than 90 hosts in WA, about half of those are reproductive so far. Um, and I think in part that's because we make an active effort to check each host and we have a reproductive biology lab that's really fantastic for that. Um, but we've also added, we think about 33 new global hosts. So on the basis of the data that we had at the time, so just to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, exterior symptoms aren't always obvious. Hopefully you would notice a dying back limb. It's not like a Phytophthora dieback where you might get the whole crown will go. It'll often just be the limb that the beetle might be in. And even when you get closer, it still is hard to, I can see the edge of a lesion there to see the symptoms. But once you get your eye in, if you're lucky, you'll get something like this shot hole appearance. It's just insane when they really get going in a mature box elder maple. And these darkened um, galleries here as well when, they, when you can break it off. Something like a coral tree, we often see it coming along the kind of ridges. Um, and the PSHB does seem to prefer kind of actively growing regions or weakened spots in a tree to infest. Um, Erythrinus can be really good as well at walling off infestations. Um, so some of these may actually be able to tolerate damage over a large amount of time. Uh, Poinciana, this is not the best photo, but you can see there's like more of a sap flow. Um, and then we've also, you know, when you dig back on an old, maybe a tree that was infested a while ago, it can be quite dry and you can almost see a little bit of a, either water or lesion damage around the shot holes as well. Uh, the London plane trees, as I said, are our new ones that we're seeing. You get this really um, interesting sap flow down the trunks as, it, as they take in and the tree responds. Um, so you get a bit closer and you've got very dark shot holes going on. And from the edge, you can see that you're getting a shot hole coming in and they're, they're getting beyond that initial cambium layer and, and taking off pretty well in those London plains now. Morton Bay figs have been one of our new big global hosts. Um, globally, everyone else was like, oh, figs, you know, they get in, they get pushed out, it's all good. Um, but our problem has been, uh, especially at this site, there will be these trees are likely stressed that it's a very ephemeral water source. The tree, the water line goes up and down or dries out completely by these trees. Um, and we had large limbs that's over 20 centimetre diameter coming down in that area. Um, and this is just of dry wood as well. We often look for dry wood on the ground. Um, we know we're pretty certain um, observationally now that they will infest downed wood of some species. We knew this from the literature already. 
um, and that with something like a fig which can contain a lot of water and probably a fungal population could persist for some time um, they're able to survive in there for some time as well uh, and black poplar is one of the ones that has one of these beautiful um, lesions on the outside caused by that that fusarium getting into the bark layer uh, I'll go through it quickly when we confirm a positive tree we um, assign a case manager so that that person will be or that group will be working with the one person we give them a control notice that puts more um, stricter measures on that property and then we devise a treatment plan which is predominantly chopping and chipping um, and then hot composting that material um, and with things like a box elder maple or a highly reproductive host like a robinia we do remove the whole tree and stump grind it as well because we know that they will keep persisting in that material and we assess other species on a case-by-case -case basis and do increase surveillance and trapping in those areas lots of comms and engagement so if you're from a an organisation that wants to do comms. This is our wonderful comms um, manager here, Marcus. Um, he has a lovely Airtable um, comms portal that if you're after high res images or social posts or media releases, he can share that with you quickly and easily. We um, do a lot of targeted comms around green waste verge collections uh, in with Gumtree and things like that. If people search for firewood during winter, something will come up because that's another waste pathway for us. Um, a lot of communications and engagement around preparing people for their trees to be removed um, and especially in public parks doing letter drops and things like that to let residents know what's happening in the area. Um, and just that repetition and multiple channels is key and trying to do as much as we can to cover such a large area and Marcus does a very, very good job of that. So that's me done. I've got other slides, but I'll leave them behind so that we can have just a question and answer. Thank you to you. And I just want to really say thank you um, to the whole response team and to DPIRD. We have people move in and out of the response constantly. Um, but the key people being at our diagnostics labs, DDLS um, is largely led by Melinda Moyer. Um, Monica Kehoe does a lot of the molecular diagnostics. Domini heads up the pathology side um, and Pia Scanlon um, has taken a lot of those beautiful images you would have seen of the close-ups of the beetles in there and then within the response our incident controller is Dave Cousins in ops we have Leanne Young and Dom Castledine and Marcus as I said who's doing incredible work with public information and I also share the SME role with Louise Croza as well so it's nice to have someone else to call on every now and then. So that's me done um, and I'll happily take any questions. Great, thank you very much. That was awesome. Such a huge amount of work. So we are getting some um, questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one is from David. Thanks, Kylie, really interesting. Do you think it's worth having some traps well outside the containment area along highways as escape is most likely to be because of human vectors? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, long distance spread is most likely by human vectors. Um, it's just a matter of how far you go, really, David. <laughs> That's a hard thing. So green waste sites are probably, uh, we knew from the outset, and they're really easy to identify where they are and to put traps on. Um, when we go into more regional areas, you just wouldn't be able to get the coverage along roads. So the traps only have about a 50 metre radius that they work in anyway, unless I guess maybe the volatiles get further. So um, we're just trying to be as strategic as possible. So that often even our traps in those regional centres, so down as far as Albany or around Bunbury, uh, in association with the box elder maple, because we know and potentially at kind of traffic stops and things like that, the people who might be taking firewood or something will be moving it. So we just try and be as smart as we can in those places. Um, but we haven't, the good thing is we haven't had any indication that it's moving quickly along highways. South Africa has had that information, but they also have a very fluid movement of risk material in terms of firewood and people who collect all sorts of firewood and moving around. Um, a lot more fluidly than we do as well. Uh, some of our 
common firewood species here, our eucalypts and that are lower risk species for PSHB, which is in our favor. So. Great. Yeah. Tracy, uh, thank you, Kylie, for a great talk. I've been looking forward to this. I noticed on your host list that there are a few native species, including Melaleuca, Grevillea, and Eucalyptus. Is there a concern that PSHB might have more of an impact on native forests in Western Australia, given the number of positives detected? Or is it more likely to be somewhat restricted to those deciduous host species? Also, are there teams <laughs> in other states? <laughs> oh, there's so many questions in there. So. Um, this is where I go, here's something I prepared earlier, if I can move in my slides. So this is the site where we've got all those um, native hosts, uh, Tracy. So this is at that, as I said, that ephemeral lake, where we've got those 80 plus year old Moreton Bay figs. And that's pretty much the site other than the Carimbias. The Carimbia actually isn't far from this. So also on that same kind of waste, rubbly, awful site that you have no idea what whether a tree's hit a pocket of something awful when it gets down. Um, and these native hosts are, are predominantly in this area in conjunction with these really big um, trees that are pumping, potentially pumping out quite a few beetles at the moment. So I don't think as a general, I still think as a general rule, our native species are quite tolerant of PSHB. Um, the global literature indicates that healthy um, because eucalyptus and melaleucas are very healthy overseas, um, certainly in California, um, are doing very well and they actually don't even get attacked in proximity to highly infested trees over there. Acacias will need to watch carefully, um, but acacias also have their own suite of beetles here and it wouldn't surprise me if that niche is somewhat occupied. Um, we've looked at a lot of acacia over time because there are so many native um, beetles or other beetles happening in acacia and luckily none of none of them until this site have been PSHB. So the dynamics really shift depending on your um, inoculum load. So in general across the landscape it's lower and in, in plenty of gardens and even um, just go to another shot here. So this was in Mason Gardens, which is, this isn't the best shot where we had more than 30 established box elder trees and there were literally eucalypts intertwined with those trees that were not, like you could see the beetles had had a go, but we couldn't get a beetle out of it. The beetle had not stuck around. So I think they're pretty, they are pretty prolific. They will try a lot of new hosts, but as a general rule, it doesn't seem like our natives are highly suitable. Um, and I knock on all sorts of wood when I say that as well. So we'll watch it closely. Um, it's still gonna be those deciduous hosts, those um, exotic hosts that we're expecting. Our tracking against the global host list is pretty accurate. And the hard thing about our host list as well is unfortunately we haven't put, um, you know, the number of properties or the num number of trees that we've found it on. And especially with reproductive, that's really important. So our next iteration of that reproductive host list will actually include the what we call confirmed reproductive. So where we've seen it consistently in three or more trees, then we'll pop them up um, because a lot of the ones on that reproductive host list uh, say the, because um, I know everyone was like, uh, when uh, it was a Tahitian lime came up, but that was one limb which broken off on the side. And so that, it was completely compromised where the beetles were. Um, the other parts of the tree were completely fine. Um, and are there teams in other states charged with monitoring for spread elsewhere? Yeah, so especially through those who might know, what are they called, the sub subcommittee on plant health surveillance, um, we've presented to them, we share our data with others. Um, yeah, so I guess Queensland's still looking and they occasionally and northern New South Wales will have uh, quisiverol lures. So that's like a food based attractant lure that we use out to look specifically for shot hole borers. Um, and then, but even if every, we, I think we've spoken to most forest health in um, all of the eastern states and they know, hopefully if they don't know, hopefully they do know soon, that they should be just um, keeping an eye on, especially your box elders, because your box elders will be the absolute, they're, they're the ones that you will usually pick up first because they're just so active in them when they get going. 
Great. And Nicholas has a question about the, the identification on the island off the coast and how you think it might have gotten there. Yeah, so that's on Rottnest Island for those who know Perth um, and surrounds. How far it is off the coast, I cannot say. It's definitely beyond the flight, what we would think the flight um, kind of length of the beetle would be because they really are small and going over um, a water body like that would be quite stressful for a beetle. Um, the most likely way it got there is probably in wood chips or something because they are still maintaining um, trees and plants on that island or if someone was happened to you know take their own firewood over for some reason that could also be another way that it got there so where the best guess we can have is that it's on um, infested wood material that's gone over. Great and Joanne is asking about environmental DNA and is that a feasible method for screening and surveillance? Uh, yeah, Joanna, really good question. We've started to discuss that um, already within the team. Um, so Monica Kehoe, who I spoke of, is working on an improved or, or qPCR diagnostic, because at the moment we're just with sequencing. Um, so first step is that. Uh, we've discussed with a few different groups. Yeah, it's a matter of how you, what you test for your environmental DNA. Um, you know, because you're trying to get to trees ideally. And so a watershed might give you a general idea, but it doesn't help you narrow it. Um, perhaps we, we've spoken with some people who talked about using like sticky rollers on trees, um, but we could also even just speed it up eDNA, even if you were able to quickly swab the inside of a shot hole rather than trying to pull a beetle out or something like that, um, swab the inside with a toothpick or something and use that. Um, but then you still need to be able to get to a shot hole and a lot of our shot holes tend to be higher in the canopy. So discussions are in play. It's just a matter of how you best use it, especially in this scenario. Um, you know, are you vacuuming around trees? Are you using sticky things on trees? Um, so if anyone has any bright ideas, we're always <laughs> happy to hear them. Um, and then it's just a matter of finding the um, money, time and resources to really make it happen. I had a question actually about the fusarium. Um, yep. So you touched a little bit on that and the fact that we seem to have potentially a species or an isolate coming in from, from Taiwan. Is the fusarium what's actually causing the death of the limb or is it actually the beetle or both? I, I think of it as both. Um, it's interesting in the literature, um, they kind of say invasive shot hole borer fusarium dieback complex. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it depends on your your host. The fusarium really can do a lot of damage in something like a box elder, but at the same time, it's still pretty solid with the fusarium in there. So to me, it's both, um, especially given you can't have one without the other. And it really doesn't, it's not a, because you do get systemic fusariums, right? Um, and this is not a systemic um, type of fusarium. It really is only radiating out from those shot holes. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, because I was going to ask if, you know, the chipping might kill the beetle, but is that actually then spreading the fungus more? And is that going to be an issue in down the line? Yeah, yeah. And that's why we, so we do, yeah, so we don't expect it will. We don't have any other indicators of, at the moment of any anything else picking it up as a and spreading it around um, it doesn't have spores that get off on the wind and spread on its own um, there's no indication of the fusarium being a huge risk pathway from overseas either so that's why we moved to just getting rid of wood chips as opposed to initially we actually had you know washed down with um, soapy water or with ethanol if you can but we also have to be realistic within operational constraints for everyone. So you're trying to get the risk down to the best you can. Um, so we're not expecting it to move on its own without the beetle. Um, I feel like there was another answer in there that my brain has <laughs> forgotten at some point. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's an cool. interesting one, but we're not too concerned about that as a pathway. Okay, great. Well, it looks like there are no further questions um, in the Q&A. So thank you very much, Kylie, for presenting to us today. Super interesting 
um, story at, that's developing um, such a huge amount of work that you're putting into that. So thank you for that. Thank you for protecting us <laughs> um, <laughs> over here. Um, and thank you everyone who has showed up today. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again next month at our next seminar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Bye.